Good afternoon and welcome to the ninth annual James R. Souls Lecture on the Constitution and Citizenship. Thank you for joining us. In particular, uh, I want to say thank you to all friends who are here and some new friends that we made today for, you know, uh, your attendance today. Uh, I am Julio Carrion. Uh, acting Chair of the uh, Department of Political Science and International Relations. Uh, Dave Redlosk, our chair, is, in, is on sabbatical leave. Uh, as you know, our, I don't know, 40 something Democratic candidates are chasing voters in Iowa, and Dave is chasing the candidates. So, you know, <laughs> he's been tweeting about it. Very interesting. You should check his tweets. Uh, it's truly a pleasure uh, to introduce this event uh, to, that honors Jim's memory and celebrates our Constitution. Uh, Jim was a very esteemed colleague of mine, and I remember him uh, very fondly. I am pleased that you are able to join us for today's lecture by author Elaine Wise. Uh, we are thrilled to have her here. I'm Boylan. Uh, Professor Emeritai of History will introduce her in a few minutes. Uh, this year, our lecture is part of the three-semester teaching initiative named Our Vote, History, Advocacy, Justice. Uh, Professor Boylan will tell you a little bit more about this initiative when she has the, um, the chance to, to speak to you. As I said, the uh, James R. Souls Lecture on the Constitution and Citizenship celebrates both our late colleague, Jim Souls, and Constitution Day, which is today, when we consider the role of the uh, unique document that has guided our country for more than 230 years. At this moment, when all over the world, all and new constitutions are being challenged by the forces of intolerance, xenophobia, and anti-pluralism, it is important that we reflect on the foundations and legacy of this living document. Let me uh, finish these welcoming remarks uh, by saying that because of, of the support from many of you uh, in this audience, we can honor Jim's important contributions through the James R. Soul Citizenship Endowment. The endowment funds a number of programs in the Department of Political Science and International Relations, including both undergraduate and graduate student civic engagement stipends. It is now my pleasure to ask Ed Friel, a Senior Policy Fellow at the Institute for Public Administration at the Biden School for Public Policy and Administration to give us some insight into Jim Souls and his lasting contributions to our university and our st state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a couple of very real brief comments, but uh, I have two housekeeping things I have to take care of first. In a few minutes, you're going to see a video, and there are two fellows who I think are in the audience who worked very hard to put this together and, and meet the deadline of today's event, and that's Charles Marsh and Justin Collier. So if you're here, I think I see Charles and Justin I saw earlier. Thank you, both of you, for doing a great job. I also want to mention that you can never get too much Constitution in Constitution Week. And so, and so uh, on Thursday, the history, the Student History Association, uh, the Association of History Students, whatever it is, Justin, uh, they are putting on another program on Thursday at the Trabant Center at 5 o'clock, a couple of panels uh, looking at the role of Delaware in the Constitutional Convention and in the role of the Constitution uh, in Delaware today. So if you have any, if you have an urge after today to get more into the Constitution this week, uh, please join us over at the uh, Trabant Center on Thursday at, uh, at 5 o'clock. Uh, let me just say on behalf of the folks who are on the Souls Committee and the Lecture Committee how excited we are that this year's lecture is kicking off, as you mentioned, the uh, tribute, the you know, acknowledgement, and recognition, and celebration of the 19th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution this year. 
I can't think of a more fitting way to uh, to begin that than to have this discussion today in honor of uh, our former friend Jim Souls. Um, let me just say my role in the past has, uh, I knew Jim pretty well. well. I think a lot of you know that. I was his grad assistant in, uh, I hate to say this, I was his grad assistant in 1969. Uh, I'd like to say I was a babe in the woods, but I wasn't. And then I was his uh, campaign manager in 1974 when he ran for Congress. We remained lifelong friends, and I had the honor of delivering the eulogy at his memorial service in uh, 2010. And his daughter, Catherine, is here in the front row with us today. It's good to see you, Catherine. Uh, in the past, my assignment was to take a couple of minutes and usually what I did very inadequately was try to explain to the people in the audience who did not know Jim Souls personally what Jim Souls was all about. Uh, I'm very, very excited today that my role has changed in that I'm going to be able now just to introduce uh, this, uh, this video, which I really do think does a wonderful job of capturing the essence of, of Jim Souls, who to so many of us was you know, teacher, mentor, friend, uh, and advisor. Uh, and then after the uh, video, uh, the film, uh, Dr. Boylan will be up to introduce our guests. So with that, George, take it away. He's raised up a whole generation, maybe two generations, of young people with the idea that they need to serve and they should be uh, citizens. He was very engaging and his, his spirit was you can do this. He was interested. He cared about you as a student and also as a person. Jim could teach five-year-olds, two-year-olds, 85-year-olds because he knew how to interact with them and respected them. I referred to him as one of uh, the university's great statesmen. Uh, what he did was carry the sense of our mission out into the community. He promoted being uh, an active citizen by his example of running for office himself. There's so many people that uh, became elected officials in Delaware that uh, were students of Jim's. When I met Jim Souls, I said, this is why I'm here. I had a chance to work in his campaign to serve as, the, as a volunteer, as the uh, uh, treasurer, fundraiser. Of all the people that I've known in my life who helped make it possible for me to have these opportunities, uh, but beyond my parents who gave birth to brought me into the world, it would be Jim Souls. Dr. Souls helped me to get an internship uh, at uh, the Attorney General's office in Wilmington. Dr. Souls' influence was, if that's your passion, that's what you should do. Dr. Souls was nonpartisan. Some of his best students, I'm sure, were Republicans and Democrats. So that didn't matter to him. Such a shining role model of someone who uh, did so much uh, for so many others. What I learned from him about citizenship is to give back. He would always say to us, don't thank me, pass it on. A consummate professor. He met every student where they were. No answer was really a wrong answer, so a lot of diverse views. He had ways of reaching them about their own issues, and that's what he did in class. He would run the gamut and show uh, these kids that this matters. He was a very rigorous and demanding instructor, but he, he started always from the assumption, right, that people could accomplish so much. The more time you spent around him, the more excited you were about the opportunities in the world and your chance to make a difference. Instantly grabbed his students in to say, be part of this journey with me. Years after his life ended, he's still beloved, he's still with us. As much as Jim loved his students, there was no one he loved more, I think, than Ada Lee. He hit the jackpot with Ada Lee Souls. Brilliant, beautiful, warm, loving uh, woman. And he totally supported her uh, getting involved in politics and becoming you know, a, a state representative. And she was an, an extremely effective state representative for many, many years. He and Ada Lee, they're a wonderful team. I learned so much from, from them, and uh, I just love them. Jim was, uh, was authentic, he was a real deal. He believed uh, that uh, that's how we should all be as citizen scholars. In a college academic environment where everything can be so focused on research and publishing, 
his legacy is his impact on his students. Jim was always great about encouraging students to go learn about government from the inside and so the fact that one of the legacies of Dr. Souls is the financial support for internships for students I think is a very fitting uh, legacy. He really created a lot of disciples in a lot of way to go out and do good because we all have an obligation to one another and uh, I believe that that's his legacy. I think we lead by our example. It's not uh, do as I say but do as I do and he was, uh, he was a guy that really uh, walked the talk and uh, that's uh, one of the things, one of the many things that I, I, I learned from, from him. I was at his funeral and all the luminaries of the state of Delaware were in attendance because that's who he was. Everybody knew he was Mr. Delaware and a great teacher, a great citizen himself. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ann Boylan. I'm a retired professor of history and women and gender studies. And it is my pleasant duty to introduce Elaine Weiss to you this afternoon. As you have heard, today is Constitution Day, marking the signing of the US Constitution in Philadelphia in 1787. So it's especially appropriate to call our attention to the history of voting rights, um, in addition, of course, to honoring the late Jim Souls. Today's lecture marks the opening event in a three-semester teaching initiative developed by the Department of Women and Gender Studies, collaborating with a number of units across the campus, including the Department of Political Science and International Relations, the Library, and the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Dean's Office. And as you see, uh, this teaching initiative, this is the new logo and website, uh, Our Vote, History, advocacy justice focuses on what we call the power and privilege of suffrage, the right to vote. Over the next three semesters, you will encounter a variety of courses and activities designed to commemorate both the 100th anniversary of woman suffrage, the 19th Amendment, and the 150th anniversary of black suffrage, the 15th Amendment. There will be a library exhibit, talks, courses, performances, guest speakers, a film series, and student projects. So stay tuned and look for events sporting this logo. At the end of today's talk, uh, Elaine Weiss will take questions. And as you'll notice, there are microphones set up on both sides here. So um, during the Q&A, if you'd be willing to come forward and stand at the microphone, everybody will be able to get a chance to hear your question as well as the answers. Now to today's speaker. Elaine Weiss is a journalist with the soul of a historian. What higher compliment can I give? <laughs> By that I mean that, first of all, she has all the credentials that make other journalists sit up and take notice. A master's degree from Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism, and articles in notable newspapers, magazines, The Atlantic, Harper's, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The New York Times, and so on. She's also done radio programming and won awards and fellowships from the Society of Professional Journalists and the McDowell Colony. But if you read any of her books, including a delightful study of the World War I era Women's Land Army, and now a rousing study of the struggle to ratify the 19th Amendment, you will see that she combines a journalist's skill at storytelling with the deep historical research of the historian in order to bring the past to life for modern audiences. The book on which she will speak today, this afternoon, and as you know, there, it's available for purchase in the lobby after the talk, uh, The Woman's Hour, is admired by writers and historians alike. For it, she has won the Silver Gavel Award from the American Bar Association, and now this is really impressive. Film rights have been acquired 
by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Productions, and she told us at lunch today that she has Hillary Clinton's email address. <laughs> now, we're talking contacts here. I think Spielberg is still, you know, talking through his minions, but anyway. Uh, most of all, as Casey Sepp noticed in her splendid review in The New Yorker, Elaine Weiss helps us to understand why votes for women was such a controversial proposition, why it was so difficult to get women's voting rights into the U.S. Constitution, and why it took so long to encompass all women under the terms of the 19th Amendment. Anyone who takes the right to vote for granted will think differently after reading The Woman's Hour, and I believe after hearing Elaine Weiss discuss her work today. Thank you, that was lovely. Whoops. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'm live here. Um, I'm delighted to be with you today, uh, honored to be your Constitution Day speaker, celebrating the birthday of the US government. You may have feelings about that one way or the other. Um, and also the life and legacy of clearly a very inspiring professor and civic leader, Jim Soule. So I'm honored to be here uh, in, in uh, the lecture name for him. Now, September 17th, nine, uh, pardon me, 1787, was the day of the official signing of the US Constitution in Philadelphia, just up the road a piece. Um, it was signed by 39 wealthy white men. Patriots, to be sure, even visionaries, but the system of laws they created reflected their worldview and their interests. Imagine how different it might have been. Here's a um, really wonderful drawing. This is, this is a, uh, a kind of takeoff on the famous signing of the Declaration of Independence, but you get the idea. Um, much of our history, for the past 232 years, we've been trying to improve, even repair, the document that those men signed that day. Here's another wonderful vision of um, uh, changing the Constitution to reflect women. Now, I've spent a lot of time with the US Constitution for the past six years. There's a pocket copy on my desk within easy reach. I refer to it very often because I wrote a book about the Constitution. That book, The Woman's Hour, is the story of the 19th Amendment, the largest extension of the franchise in our nation's history, giving the vote to half of the citizens of the United States who were not included when the Founding Fathers created their system of government supposedly for and by the people. The women citizens of the newly formed US weren't just forgotten. They were purposefully left out, given no voice in the great American experiment of government by the people. They were denied the most fundamental right of democracy, the vote. So the Woman's Hour is the story, you might say, of the limitations of the US Constitution. But I'd say it's also a salute to the Constitution as a living document. It's one that can change, can be corrected, can be expanded, can be improved. Because the genius of the, of the Constitution is that it can be amended. It can keep striving for a more perfect union. It was found wanting even at the very, very beginning, and was amended immediately by the first set of amendments, what we call the Bill of Rights. And the amending process is difficult, and rightly so. Changing our fundamental laws should not be easy or done lightly. So the Woman's Hour is the story of the struggle to make one big change in the Constitution, 
the 19th Amendment, correcting what the Founding Fathers conveniently forgot, or rather refused to consider, and what our leaders of government adamantly refused to correct for the next 130 years after that day of signing. So my book is really about how change is made in a democracy and in society, because the 19th Amendment was not just a legal change. It was not just a constitutional change or even just an election law change. It didn't just double the national electorate. It didn't just make women full citizens for the very first time. It marked a societal change, a cultural shift about the role and the rights of women. And of course, that change is still ongoing. The fight for women's suffrage is one of the defining civil rights struggles in our nation's history. And it's one that cuts to the heart of what democracy means. Who gets to participate? Who has a voice? When we say, we the people, do we really mean everyone? And I'd say we are asking that question again today. It's the story about how American women's demand for the vote, once considered radical, crazy, subversive, impossible, was slowly and methodically and at great cost transformed into a part of the US Constitution. Now, if you're like me, as Professor Boylan uh, referred, I'm not a suffrage scholar, but I had a very, very fuzzy idea of how this all happened, uh, which is why I wrote the book. I realized as an American voter, as a woman voter, I had no idea how I, at one time, did not have the right to vote and then had the right to vote. What happened in between? And the history books, the, most of the, the usual sort of high school texts did not help. Um, I asked my friends, do you know how American women got the vote? And these are rather sophisticated, well-educated people. And they looked at me blankly and said, um, uh, Seneca Falls. <laughs> I realized there was repair work to be done. So again, if you have this fuzzy idea that I had, it goes something like this. Um, and again, this is how American women won the vote. And that active verb is really important. We were not given the vote. We were not granted the vote. It took enormous effort to win, fight and win that vote. So here's, here's the fuzzy idea. A bunch of women meet someplace in upstate New York called Seneca Falls. They're wearing hoop skirts and bonnets. It's really very picturesque. And they, um, they ask for the vote. And fast forward a little bit, and there are a few marches and picket signs, and then poof, American men see the light and grant the vote to their women, um, their wives, their daughters, their sisters, their mothers. It's portrayed, it's the march of progress, it was uh, evolution, it just happened naturally, it was an idea whose time had come. No, that's not how it happened. It required three generations of fearless activists working over seven decades to finally secure the vote for American women. And the culmination of that whole crusade what we call the women's suffrage movement, came down to one fierce six-week battle staged in Nashville, Tennessee in the summer of 1920. In the summer of 1920, one last state was needed to ratify the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, giving all women in every state the right to vote for the very first time. 35 states had ratified. 36, or three quarters of the 48 states in the Union, needed to ratify for it to enter the Constitution. And Tennessee could be the 36th because Delaware refused to be the 36th. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And here's this wonderful editorial cartoon of Uncle Sam trying to button up the last button. So if the Tennessee legislature approved the amendment, it would become the law of the land just in time for the fall 1920 presidential election. 
If the amendment failed in Tennessee, it could be delayed indefinitely. The suffragists feared momentum was not with them and that they saw that the, the nation was swinging in a more reactionary mode. And in fact, the 1920s politically are very conservative. We think of the flappers, but politically it was a conservative time. And they really feared that if they lose Tennessee, it's really their last hope. They, the amendment might not get ratified in their lifetimes. And this, is, this was not an idle fear. And those of us who have lived through the vicissitudes of the Equal Rights Amendment, which was introduced into Congress 96 years ago and is still not ratified, I think we can understand that they were right to fear this because an amendment can come very close to the finish line of ratification and not make it over for a very long time. So the enfranchisement of half of the citizens of the United States was at stake, and it all came down to Tennessee. By 1920, the suffragists had been fighting for the vote for 72 years. The injustice of women's disenfranchisement was a topic of discussion even before that first outrageous public demand for the vote was made by Elizabeth Cady Stanton at that Seneca Falls Convention, the women's rights meeting in 1848. See, here's a Harper's Magazine uh, drawing of it. Photography wasn't in use yet, so we have a drawing. Now, women had very few legal rights at this time. And according to both the US Constitution and state constitutions, besides being denied the ballot, American women also did not have the right to testify in a court of law or bring civil suit in her own name. She could not be judged by a jury of her peers because women could not serve on juries. She couldn't be admitted to institutes of higher education or enter the professions. And in fact, educating women was considered a waste of time. And their destiny was to be wives and mothers. There was a, uh, and it was even dangerous for society for women to try to be educated. The conventional medical wisdom in the 19th century held that women were too fragile and too nervous to handle deep study. I think, interesting concept. Um, and if they did study, the blood flow would be diverted to their brains from their reproductive organs. <laughs> And it would endanger their ability to bear children. This was real medical accepted uh, practice. And the entire species would be at risk. So this was used as reasoning for women not to be able to enter higher education and also not to be able to vote. Now, if a woman was married, any property or wages belonged to her husband. She had no custodial rights over her children. They too belonged to her husband. And Elizabeth Stanton tackled all of these in her brilliant Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, which were read at the Seneca Falls Convention. But many of those at attending the conference thought that her resolution number nine, which asked for the vote, was really a terrible idea. It was too radical, they thought. It was ridiculous. It was going to make them come under um, uh, uh, disrepute. They actually begged her to withdraw that resolution. But there was a young man in the audience who driven his buggy 50 miles from his home to attend the meeting. And he stood up and he supported Stanton's resolution. And it was Frederick Douglass, 30-year-old Frederick Douglass, just 10 years out of slavery. He had come down from Rochester uh, to attend the meeting. And he said, no, you must demand the vote. It will never be given to you. And it will never be given to me unless we fight for it. Power never acceded anything without a demand, you must demand this. And he convinced the other very reluctant participants at Seneca Falls to support Elizabeth Stanton's outrageous resolution number nine, asking for the vote. And 
Douglas called himself a women's rights man for the rest of his life, and he truly is. He's, if anything, the hero of my book. He believes in universal suffrage. And um, Douglas and the women we know as the early pioneers of suffrage, Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, they knew each other already. They had worked together as abolitionists. These women were abolition workers before they were suffrage workers. And abolition and suffrage were sibling movements through the Civil War. They fully expected that after the war, universal suffrage would be enacted. Black men and white women and black women would all get the vote. But they were sadly disappointed. They were told that the nation could not handle two great reforms at once. Douglas sadly had to tell them that black men needed the vote desperately. With us, it is a matter of life and death, he pleaded as Reconstruction era violence erupted, in, especially in the South. It was not the woman's hour, he told them. And the woman's hour will come, I promise, but you must wait. It was a heartbreaking split. Stanton and Anthony refused to support the 14th and 15th Amendments since women were excluded from them. Stanton said, if that word male be inserted in the amendment, it will take us at least a century to get it out. She was almost right. It would take more than 50 years. In anger, Stanton and Anthony expressed vile racist sentiments against black and immigrant men who were not as well educated as they were, but were still able to vote. It took years to heal the breach, and racism on all sides of the suffrage movement was never truly resolved. Now, in the years since Seneca Falls, tens of thousands of dedicated suffragists had weighed, waged over 900 local, state, and national campaigns to win the ballot. They traveled hundreds of thousands of miles to do, as Susan Anthony described it, organize, educate, and agitate in tiny towns and big cities all over the nation. We see them go from horse and buggy at the beginning of the movement to cars at the end. They had to change hearts and minds about women's role in society before they could ever hope to change the law. And it was a stupendous feat of organization. Without any of the travel or communication tools we take for granted today. When the movement started, passenger train travel was really in its infancy. There was no transcontinental railroad yet. Um, there was no typewriter. There was no telephone. And even in 1920, when my book takes place, radio isn't being used. So this all had to be done on foot, by horse, by buggy, by hand. And um, as one young woman who, a uh, uh, young editorial assistant in my publishing house, read the early um, galley of the manuscript and came into my editor's office and said, wow, I don't know how these women did it. They organized without Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but they did. They held meetings and they held rallies, and they marched, which was not considered proper for women to do. They didn't wear pink pussy hats, but they did wear their marching uniforms, white dresses with yellow sashes. And here are some wonderful pictures of the women marching. This actually, this picture is in uh, my city of Baltimore. And here's another. They, um, today it's hard to imagine how brave, how difficult it was, how brave they had to be to march like this in public. It was not just a matter of saying, OK, I think I'm going to go to the Women's March. Um, it was you, you took a risk, a social and personal risk to do this. Suffragists endured contempt and ridicule. Here we go in their communities, in their churches, and in the press. And we're going to see some rather strong images that the anti-suffrage forces 
forth to the public um, describing their antipathy to this idea. Again, what would I do with the suffragists? Again, silence her. Which do you prefer? The, uh, you could be a loving mother or you could be a street corner zealot. They were um, pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables. They were attacked by mobs of angry men and boys. They were denounced as radical, radicals, perverts, traitors, anarchists, bad wives and mothers, of course, even Bolsheviks. They were derided as unattractive, unsexed she-men. And here you see some pictures. Again, this was going to destroy the American home if women um, took up the idea that they could participate in politics or that they could go outside the home at all. So here's um, a classic anti-suffrage cartoon, mom is smoking a cigar and reading the racing news when women can vote and dad is having to hold the screaming baby and knit his own um, trousers out of her old skirts. Here's another view of that. It's election day, mom is going off to vote and dad is again holding the screaming babies. Uh, the apocalypse is coming and uh, again, this is to, to portray that this is going to affect the home negatively. The men who supported them were belittled as Mabels and Nancys. And again, they're depicted as ugly and uh, un you know, unappealing women because why would a, an attractive woman want the vote? She would have a man to vote for her. Guess which one is supposedly the suffragist? <laughs> and again, they weren't subtle about their fears. They really felt that uh, men would be emasculated by the idea of women being able to vote. And here's my favorite bit of trouble. I think it's self-explanatory. In their quest for equal citizenship, the women of the suffrage movement employed a wide strategy, uh, a wide variety of stratagems and methods. Many of these, marches, demonstrations, picketing, which we'll soon see, acts of civil disobedience, sophisticated lobbying and public relations uh, operations, and the use of legal test cases would be adopted by the civil rights campaigns of the 20th and 21st centuries. The suffragists were ingenious and fearless. They had to be. To test the prohibitions against women voting, Susan Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and about 150 other women attempted to vote in the 1972 presidential election. Here you see uh, Susan Anthony with her threatening umbrella. She's often portrayed with her threatening umbrella. And she has usurped Uncle Sam's hat. And this is um, captioned, the woman who dared. She dared to vote. Now she was testing, she and the other women, were testing a legal theory that according to the 14th Amendment, as a citizen, women inherently already possess the right to vote. They just had to exercise it. I have been and gone and done it, she wrote to her collaborator, Elizabeth Stanton. Susan Anthony was soon arrested, put on trial, and convicted of illegal voting in a federal election. She um, refused to pay her fine, but she did go around New York State giving, bringing her case to the public. And here's actually the uh, court transcript. Um, and she asked the question, is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? And of course, we're asking that question again today. Failure of this voting experiment led Stanton and Anthony to draft a constitutional amendment which would supersede all the state laws prohibiting women from voting. It was based on the 15th Amendment, so it's very appropriate that we be celebrating them together here. Um, the language of which was, the right of citizens to vote shall not be abridged or denied 
on account of sex. It was introduced into Congress in 1878, and it was stalled there for 40 years. Every year, the suffragists would go up to Capitol Hill to testify, and here's a drawing of Elizabeth Stanton uh, testifying in one of the committees that was hearing. Um, she said that she often, when she testified, found that the committee members were eating their lunch, polishing their shoes, clipping their nails, sharpening their pencils, doing anything but listening to her. And she had to refrain from throwing her manuscript of testimony at their heads. I guess she's, she's shown in a, in a moment of um, restraint. So um, the amendment was voted down in committee or on the floor of the, of the Congress 28 times. Meanwhile, the suffragists worked in the states, which can confer the suffrage to its citizens by legislative action or constitutional change um, through a referendum. Now, these popular referenda only had male voters. Only men could decide whether women deserved the vote. And uh, again, only a few states ever passed resolutions um, that, that changed the constitutions and gave women the vote. Here in Delaware, suffragists organized uh, extremely well, but they were repeatedly stymied by political feuds, corruption in the legislature, and strong pockets of anti-suffrage sentiment. They were also put at a disadvantage by Del uh, Delaware law, which prohibited changing the state constitution by referendum. And this was a real disadvantage to them because even if only men could vote in these referenda, at least the suffragists could have mounted an educational campaign explaining why it was good and important for women to get the vote. And this would, could have increased sympathy and support, but they were denied this opportunity. Now, one place where sympathy seemed to be lacking was among Delaware's women's clubs, whose members were not supportive of this unladylike business of demanding the vote until late, late in the process. So, organizing a state suffrage association was rather slow, and it wasn't until around 1896 that it really began to get traction in the state. But even so, by 1902, the State Suffrage Association was advising Delaware women to pay their taxes under protest to um, emphasize that no taxation without representation. Women were paying taxes, but they weren't allowed to vote. And so they had this whole campaign to, to either not pay your taxes or to do it under protest. Um, they engineered several attempts to change the state constitution by legislative action to strike the word male from the quali qualifications for voting in the constitution. But these were repeatedly unsuccessful. By 1913, the Suffrage Association reported 174 members in the state, dues paying members, and another 560 registered sympathizers. By 1914, the suffragists felt confident enough to stage the first ever suffrage parade in Wilmington, and then to erect a tent at the state fair to distribute uh, brochures and, and leaflets advocating for suffrage. And all of that, um, it was still true that Delaware was not a promising suffrage state. Nevertheless, Delaware produced some extraordinary national suffrage leaders. Uh, one of them being um, uh, Florence Bayard Hillis, who was the daughter of a very distinguished Delaware family. And she became the um, Delaware division chair of the National Women's Party. And here we see her speaking from the boot of, a, of an automobile. Um, she was joined, uh, actually she was recruited by another Delaware woman, Mabel Vernon, one of the founders of the Women's Party, 
and she, here we're going to see her again speaking on the street, and also, um, whoops, picketing the White House. Um, now, there were also distinguished anti-suffragists here in Delaware, Mrs. Wilson being one of them. Um, again, a very strong and sophisticated anti-suffrage um, campaign was waged whenever suffrage became an issue in the state. Now, both um, Florence Hillis and, and um, uh, what's her name, Vernon? Um, Mabel, Mabel, why didn't I remember Mabel? Mabel Vernon were part of a new approach to winning suffrage. So while the federal amendment was stuck in Congress for decades and state victories were few and far between, frustration began to grow in the suffrage movement. A new generation, the third generation of suffragists, grew impatient. They were no longer willing to wait or to plead politely. They were willing to be aggressive to be rude, to definitely be unladylike. They were willing to be disruptive and to break the law if necessary. The movement split. And we see this happen in reform movements throughout history. Um, we see it happen um, that there's a disagreement, there's, there's an impatience um, because things are not moving fast enough. We see this happen in the uh, abolition movement. We see it happen in the temperance movement in the uh, labor movement, in the mid 20th century civil rights movement, even in the gay rights movement later in the 20th century. It's almost part of the natural ecology of uh, long-term uh, reform movements. And it happened in the suffrage movement. A young Quaker woman named Alice Paul from Philadelphia, who had trained with the more radical element of the suffragists in Great Britain under Mrs. Pankhurst, left the mainstream suffrage organization here to practice what she called direct action techniques. And her National Women's Party did things that had never been done before. They picketed the White House. They protested on the states of the Capitol. They burned President Woodrow Wilson in effigy. And this was considered not only radical and unpatriotic, but it was World War, time of World War I. It was considered treasonous. Here you see they call him Kaiser Wilson. It's very controversial. It was uh, deplored by many in the suffrage movement. So hundreds of women's party suffragists were arrested, as were Vernon and Hillis. And they were, um, they were, these were on ridiculous charges like obstructing the sidewalk or lighting a match after sunset. Of course, they were only exercising their First Amendment rights. But they refused to post bail, they considered themselves political prisoners, and they served time in prison for their civil disobedience in decrepit, vermin-infested cells. They were physically assaulted, clubbed, tied to the wall, not allowed to read or write or even to to talk to one another, they communicated by singing. And when they refused to eat, they were force fed with tubes rammed down their noses. Alice Paul herself was held in solitary confinement. To break her, doctors threatened to commit her to an insane asylum. They wanted to break her leadership. First, there was nothing wrong with her. When the suffragists were finally released, they toured the country in copies of their suffrage, uh, pardon me, of their prison uniforms, tailor-made by a, a seamstress, um, and they went across the nation in a Pullman car, 28 of them living in this Pullman car, and they would stop at every city along the way. There was a northern route and then a southern route, um, giving lectures and speeches and having parades and rallies and confronting the public and saying, we are your sisters, we are your mothers, we're your daughters, and we have been arrested and served time in prison for asking for the vote. And they generated a fair amount of, of sympathy uh, for this. And here they are uh, marching with a sign, 
resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. It was a brilliant public relations move. Finally, after World War I, when women served their nation in ways they had never done before and had been real partners in the war effort, Congress couldn't think of another uh, reason to deny them the vote, and the federal amendment was very narrowly passed by both houses of Congress and sent to the states for ratification. This is in June 1919. So we just celebrated that ratification at the, uh, that uh, passage by the Congress. So by spring 1920, 35 states had ratified. And all eyes looked to Delaware to become the 36th. Delaware was the first state to ratify the US Constitution. We, we know that. I know we're very proud of that, first in the nation. But Delaware didn't really have a good track record when it came to ratifying subsequent constitutional amendments. Um, the Delaware legislature refused to ratify the 13th, 14th, or 15th amendment, the Reconstruction Amendments, which abolished slavery, established civil rights, and due process, and gave black men the vote. They also rejected the 17th Amendment, which gave, uh, provided for direct election of US senators because this removed a degree of patronage and power from the political establishment and they didn't want any part of it. So Delaware stalled on calling a special session to consider ratification of the 19th Amendment for almost a year uh, after it was sent to the state. So it's not until March that Governor Towson, who was a supporter of the amendment finally called a special session to consider ratifying. Now on the surface, the situation looked very promising. The suffragists interviewed every legislator and a majority seemed inclined to ratify. Governor Towson was really supportive. Uh, the suffragists opened a headquarters in Dover. They had mass rallies throughout the state. There were petitions with signatures of 20,000 Delaware women supporting ratification. They had endorsements from the State Grange, from the Federation of Labor, from the Methodist Convention, from the state committees of both the Democrat and Republican parties. It looked great. Never mind. Opposition from the state's business interests, animosity towards the governor, and controversy surrounding a local school tax issue, and a feud among Republicans doomed the ratification effort. As one Del uh, Delaware Republican pronounced, if this legislature will refuse to ratify the proposed amendment and thus prevent the hysterical rout of the politicians of the country to make shreds and patches of our sacred constitution, the state of Delaware will receive in the near future the greatest possible glory. That was his pitch to not to ratify. The Senate passed a resolution of ratification, but refused to send it to the House. And I'm going to have to ask the local historians and political scientists to explain this a little bit to me. As one historical account put it, the bill was placed under lock and key in the Senate. For in Delaware, bills were known to have been stolen. <laughs> uh, again, I don't quite understand, but I'm willing to learn. Six weeks of delays and, and adjournments, intrigue and double dealing followed. Finally, on June 2nd, the House simply adjourned without ratifying. And Delaware joined the list of southern states uh, using the rationale of states' rights in rejecting women's suffrage. The defeat shocked both the local and national suffragists. And it put them on the defensive. They realized that the amendment really was in danger. So only a few weeks later, this, uh, after the defeat in Delaware, the amendment was on the cusp of victory, or possibly defeat, as it arrived in Tennessee, because Tennessee was a very dangerous place 
to stage this definitive battle for women's suffrage. Delaware had been considered moderate, a border state. They had really thought that it would work. They did not think Tennessee was going to work. Nearly all the other southern states, including Delaware, had already rejected the amendment, including my state of Maryland, on the grounds of states' rights and on the racist rationale they did not want black women to vote. Suffragists knew they faced an uphill battle in Tennessee, but they really had no choice. It was their last best hope. So all the forces for and against women's suffrage gathered in Nashville, and the campaign generals arrived. National suffrage leader Carrie Chapman Catt, protege of Susan B. Anthony, who chose her to lead the movement into the 20th century. She's known as the chief. She's a brilliant strategist. She comes down from headquarters in New York and spends six miserable weeks in house arrest, uh, basically, in the Hermitage Hotel. She dare not st set foot in the legislature, but she directs everything from her hotel room. Uh, also arriving that same night at Union Station, Nashville, was young Sue Shelton White, a daughter of Tennessee who had um, joined Alice Paul in the Women's Party and was sent by Miss Paul home to Tennessee to direct the Women's Party campaign to win ratification. So now we have two separate women's organizations, suffrage organizations, working towards the same goal, but working separately and uh, with their own staffs, with their own strategy, not cooperating with one another. Also arriving that same night, Josephine Pearson, the leader of the Tennessee anti-suffragists, who had promised her mother that she would fight the scourge of women's suffrage if it ever reached her home state of Tennessee. And she arrived from her home in the Southern Hills to defend her home state from what she called the feminist peril. They were joined by more than a thousand women and men from across the nation there to enter the fray. Now they were powerful forces working against ratification in Tennessee, political, corporate and ideological foes, each with their own reason for opposing the amendment. Politicians who feared this unpredictable new voting bloc. 27 million women would be eligible to vote in 1920 if the amendment was, was ratified, and no one knew how they were going to vote. And the politicians were very nervous about it. Clergymen some supported suffrage, many did not. Many believed that women voting went against God's plan, as they called it, because he had made, or she had made, um, Adam to be dominant over Eve. And to question that went against biblical teaching, and they used biblical language to fight against uh, giving women the vote. Corporations who believed that women would be bad for business. And this was a big element of the defeat in both Delaware and in Tennessee. We don't often think of this idea of corporate opposition to suffrage, but it was very, very uh, powerful part of the whole equation. For instance, the textile manufacturers did not want women to vote because they feared if women, if mothers could vote, they might want to abolish child labor. And these industries depended upon child labor, labor and cheap women's labor. And they were really afraid it was going to affect their bottom line. The liquor industry feared that even though prohibition was already in effect, they feared that if women were able to vote in 1920, it would be enforced more rigorously. They were hoping that if they could keep women away from the ballot, that maybe it would not be enforced so strictly. And so they work very hard to, to defeat ratification. Uh, the liquor lobby sponsored a speakeasy on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville. Um, it was called the Jack Daniels Suite after Tennessee's favorite whiskey. And legislators there, it was open 24-7. Prohibition is in effect. And um, applied 
free liquor for any legislator who'd come up and listen to the reasons that he should refuse to ratify. And at one point, Carrie Katz says, are all the legislators in this whole chamber drunk? Because they're bouncing off the walls, they're singing, keep the home fires burning. And she's told yes. <laughs> but the most passionate foes of the 19th Amendment turned out to be women. That women might oppose their sisters being enfranchised was really shocking to me when I first encountered it in my research. But I came to understand that many anti-women were social and religious conservatives who feared that suffrage would bring about a profound and unhealthy shift in gender roles. It would endanger the American home and bring about what they called the moral collapse of the nation. It would alter private life, not just public life. And here's a, one of my favorite anti-suffrage broadsides. It's called America When Feminized. And it shows uh, a hen and a rooster. And the hen is wearing her votes for women sash. And she's just walked off the nest. And the rooster calls, off, uh, calls after her and says, Ma, the eggs are going to get cold. And she calls back, sit on them yourself, old man. My country calls me. And one of the many taglines is, a vote for the federal amendment is a vote for organized female nagging forever. <laughs> I want a bumper sticker. <laughs> and, but the, all of this is an important reminder that the debate over women's suffrage was never just a political argument. It was also a social and cultural, and for some, a moral debate about women's role in society. It was a precursor to what we call the culture wars. There were layers of passion and fear uh, that made it much more complicated than just a political issue. Now, all sides confront one another in Nashville and it gets wild. There's bribes and booze and propaganda and blackmail, conspiracies and kidnappings and fistfights, the newspapers call it suffrage Armageddon. The outcome remains in doubt until the very last moment. And I'm not going to spoil it for you. But <laughs> it, it does come down to a single vote of conscience from the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature who receives a letter from his mother. Now, all this took place almost a century ago, but I think you'll find The Woman's Hour is a book of history with surprisingly even unnerving modern themes. It helps explain where we've been, but also where we are right now. It deals with topics that dominate our headlines, voting rights and voter suppression, women's rights, inequality, dark money in politics, the role of religion in public policy, and racism. Because the history of suffrage in America is inevitably a story about race. In Nashville, there are cries of white supremacy and states' rights. Here we go, another one. Yes. Okay, the Ku Klux Klan is invoked as a dog whistle. And the Confederate flag is waved in defiance. This is a picture of the opening of the anti-suffrage headquarters in the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville. Uh, Josephine Pearson is uh, standing on your right. Um, a, lead, a national leader of the anti-suffrage movement is holding the Confederate battlefield, uh, battle flag. And there are all kinds of symbols of the Ku Klux Klan in this uh, photograph. It was very purposefully staged. Uh, anyone who looked at this, who understood Tennessee history, knew what it was saying. Uh, it was a very potent piece of propaganda. Now, I wrote this book before the 2016 presidential election. In fact, I handed it in the day before the election. 
But this story of the suffragists' long fight for democracy and the final battle in Nashville has taken on layers of meaning I could not have anticipated. This history of citizens fighting for their rights enters a new dimension as rights we've assumed were secure. Voting rights, citizenship rights, press freedom, women's rights appear to be endangered again. I think there are important lessons to be learned from the fight for women's suffrage. That social change is slow and political change is hard. That the struggle to expand our democracy is ongoing. It was not accomplished in 1920. It's not complete today. While the 19th Amendment did give the vote to all women, black women and men, Asian women and Native American men and women would have to wait decades longer to secure their voting rights. Jim Crow laws in states, especially in the South, prevented black women, as it prevented black men, from exercising the franchise until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I think the suffrage movement also teaches us that reform movements are imperfect. The story of women's suffrage is both inspiring and a cautionary tale. It's complicated. It's messy. There are moral compromises made to achieve success, and we need to learn from those mistakes. I hope the story I tell will teach a new generation of activists that protest is patriotic and necessary, but it must be followed up by well-designed and sustained political strategies. The suffragists did not just march and picket. They also debated and lobbied and drafted legislation and campaigned. And they carried on after the 19th Amendment was secure. Carrie Catt established the League of Women Voters. And Alice Paul and Sue White, uh, the young woman from Tennessee, drafted the Equal Rights Amendment to carry the next step of uh, making women's rights equal in our nation. That was 1923. It has been 96 years. The vote is a prayer, as Carrie Catt described it. The vote is power. And today, we must protect the vote for all citizens. There's much work still to be done. Voting rights are being restricted in many states after the Supreme Court decision in um, Holder versus Shelby County. Um, those gutted the enforcement provisions of the uh, Voting Rights Act. And there's been a surge of restrictive legislation coming out of more than 25 states. Voting rights cannot and should not be made a partisan issue. They are indeed a stress test of our democracy, of the health of our democracy, and we are failing that test. What we need to do is to exercise our sacred duty of voting and making it clear sending that message that this kind of restrictive voting uh, laws are not acceptable. And we must do this to make the words of the preamble of the US Constitution, which we are celebrating today, we the people finally ring loud and ring true. Thank you very much. Anyone have some questions? Come right up, or we can, yeah, we can bring the, just gonna grab the other mic. microphone around. That might make it easier. Yes. There's been mention of Spielberg having the rights to your book. Is there, in fact, a plan that is being executed to make this into some a TV? Yes. TV <laughs> series, is that what it is? Yes. Yes, uh, TV series. Um, Secretary Hillary Clinton is the executive producer. Um, she read the book very early on, and she contacted me. 
and said, this is important. This is an important story that most people don't know. I didn't know it. And I think it's an important message about the, the right to vote, the importance of voting, um, the dangers of, of not voting. And so we've, we've partnered, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Spielberg's Amblin production company is you know, putting this through all the, the hoops it has to go, and we're, we're about to start writing the um, pilot script. So it is moving along. So I hope, again, to bring this to a large audience. I hope everyone in America reads my book, but they might, there might be a few more people who, who see it. Uh, and again, it's, it's a story that we, we don't know in detail well enough. Is there a target date? Sure, but I'm not sure well <laughs> you know, we, we would like to get it out um, you know, as soon as possible in 2020. We'll see. But it is being made. I, I just don't know, you know if it'll make the target date, but we're certainly trying. In your research, Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was struck by the pictures of the parades and uh -huh. how organized they are and how uh -huh. not only are the suffragists um, you know, lined up and marching, but the crowd seems to be really orderly. What did you learn about the, what happened at those parades? Were they orderly events? Were they theatrical? What, what were those like? Oh, well, there were many, many parades, but some of them were not orderly at all in terms of, of the crowds. There's a famous one, the, the first national um, uh, parade march is in uh, March of 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And it's an incredible affair. Alice Paul actually uh, is the organizer. There's 8,000 women uh, participating. There are floats. There are women on horseback. There are decorated um, automobiles and women on trucks. I mean, it's just this amazing uh, uh, organized procession. And men and boys attack the, the marchers and they throw them off the floats, they rip their clothes, they rip their banners, they really, really assault them, stomp on them, and the police do nothing. There's actually um, congressional um, uh, hearings looking into this, because it was such an outrageous uh, moment, and no one was punished. I, I think the police commissioner you know, may have resigned or something, but. Uh, and again, then the, um, it depended. Sometimes they were great and, and people were, were very enthusiastic. And sometimes men especially felt very threatened. And men and boys, there, there are this photographic evidence of men attacking the women. So it depended. Did the presidential election of 1920 play into <laughs> into the whole yes. bailiwick of Oh yes, very much. It's the, the, if you re read the book, um, the, the election plays a big part. First of all, the suffragists knew that this was, going, this was a catalyst for the political parties to, to want to, to get this through or not. Um, and so the, the role of the political parties at the national and state levels, the, the candidates themselves become big characters in the story because um, both sides are trying to, get, both the suffragists and the anti-suffragists are trying to get them on their side and they waffle all around. Um, you, you will see uh, both the uh, Republican candidate, Warren G. Harding, and the Democratic candidate, James Cox, who's also running with his vice presidential candidate, Franklin Roosevelt. And so you see them, um, they're, the role they play, and it's a large one. Um, I, you know, one thing I didn't expect was that it would all unfold um, with the Republican candidate, Warren Harding, um, was, uh, being blackmailed by one of his mistresses. And he, the uh, Republican National Committee paid her a very large sum uh, to go on an around the world cruise. 
and during the um, campaign, she was in Asia, uh, far away from the reach of the press. And um, that was only one of his mistresses. Another one had his love child. She was secreted in an apartment. Um, all of this was, was happening, and, and um, his, his campaign slogan was, America first. So it, it was really very interesting. I know, knew nothing that this was going to resonate when I was writing this, you know. It was just historical, and then suddenly it was all over the news. Um, so it was, it, yes, the presidential campaign plays a very large role. You, you talked about Frederick Douglass in your early remarks. Uh, and his support for women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. um, in your research, did you find uh, strong connections and maybe some new connections to the abolitionist movement and some of you know Frederick Douglass's involvement with the, the women's anti-slavery uh, mm -hmm. uh, society and that sort of thing? Oh yes, yes. I mean, I'm not. I would never um, uh, purport to have. Um, broken new ground, new scholarly ground. There are wonderful scholars who, who, who are doing this. Um, but I certainly, the connection between abolition and women's rights, again, it all comes out of the idea of natural rights, that every human being is imbued with natural rights, and so there should not be slaves, and there should not be um, uh, unequal citizenship. So it, it does kind of naturally come out of that. Um, the, the racial aspects of the relationships is, is very, very uh, complicated, and um, I, I try to tackle it very forthrightly. Um, you know, calling out the, the compromises that are made, the suffragists, uh, but also looking at how the anti-suffragists really weaponize the idea of race. And by the time it's, it's the ratification process, they are pulling out all the stops. And they are using race as uh, one of the main reasons to not, not ratify, because it would allow black women to vote. So um, race becomes um, a dominant theme in the whole study. And, I, and it's complicated. It's not so simple um, when, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois is part of this whole debate uh, about women's suffrage. And he also, at, at some point, uh, he, he's a supporter, um, but he points out that when black men can vote in the North, um, and if it's a referendum on, on suffrage in that state, they tended to vote against women's suffrage. So it, it's very complicated. It is not so simple. And that complication makes it extremely rich and extremely interesting to study. But I, I do um, kind of wince when I see some very like, blanket statements made about racism in the movement. Absolutely true, um, but it's complicated, just like all parts of history are complicated. And I want to have that whole story out. And one of the great things about the centennial coming um, in next August and this whole ramp up to it and things like studying the 15th and 19th Amendments, which you'll be doing, is that it gives an impetus for further research, deeper research. And I know in, in many places, including um, Tennessee, where my book takes place, and I'm still very, very much involved uh, with, with activities to, to commemorate suffrage there, there's a whole group of um, researchers who are going into the places where the story resides, especially in minority communities, but it's not been told because it's, it wasn't where the regular records were. It's not in the archives. It's in the church records. It's in the women's clubs. It's in the, the social societies. And so when you start looking there, you get hints about how incredibly organized African-American women were, um, how active uh, those and important they were, and it's not part of the usual canon because it was not easy to find. In some cases, it has been lost, but we can see clues of it to, to fill in some of those empty spaces. So for me, um, the, the centennial, one of the, the advantages of, of celebrating it is to make the record more complete, more complicated, more messy, uh, but fuller, and get all those voices in that have been missing. <laughs>
um, Carrie Chapman Catt was a product of her time. <laughs> and uh, by the time the 1920s hit, America was swinging to be very conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, soon the KKK would march down Pennsylvania Avenue. Yes. Um, she been, has been quoted as saying that suffrage would be good for white supremacy herself in her own rhetoric. And can you share with us how the uh, leadership of the white suffragist movement weaponized white supremacy themselves to affirm the role of white supremacy in order to win their victory? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, was there ever a, uh, a, a, a coming to terms with their African-American sisters who had been part of their march but then had been left by the wayside? Yeah. Well, that is a, that's a really large question uh, and an important one. Um, I would say that, um, yes, the suffragists did use, when necessary, the rationale um, that the 19th Amendment was not going to rock the boat of white supremacy. They made these arguments, when you have to look at who they had to make these arguments to. They had to get the 19th Amendment, uh, which started as the 16th Amendment, by the way, um, after 40 years, they had to convince truly racist um, congressmen and senators, uh, not just from the South, but all over, but let's say just the Southern senators. They had to convince quite a few of them if they were ever gonna get um, passage in the Congress. And what did they use to, to smooth the way for, for agreement uh, to vote for, for, for the amendment? Well, you know, there are more white women than black women. Don't worry so much. I mean, they were using, these are the kind of weasel words they used. Uh, some believed it, some truly, some suffragists were absolute racist, absolutely. Carrie Catt, I think, was using it when it was necessary. I do not believe she was truly, truly a racist, though she makes some very uncomfortable decisions and comments. Uh, but then they have to go back and get ratification from 36 states, which has to include some southern states. And they're, now they're, they're confronting the racism in the legislatures. Now they have hundreds of racist men that they have to convince. And they use those arguments to, to get it through. Um, yes, we should use that as, um, as documentary evidence of, of the arguments they were using, and they are totally racist arguments. But you have to look at what they were facing. If, um, if they had not tried to assuage the fears of those um, congressmen and senators and legislators, the 19th Amendment would not have passed. Uh, at all, or been ratified. I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, on the other hand, I think what has to be blamed much more directly are the state legislatures, which then use Jim Crow laws to prevent black women from voting. Yes, on, on paper, by the Constitution, both black men with the 15th and black women with the 19th have the right to vote, but it's the racist Jim Crow laws that prevent them from voting. It's not the 19th Amendment. Um, and then Congress has the power to enforce these laws and chooses not to, and still chooses not to. So there's a lot of blame to go around. And I think this, the suffrage leaders deserve to, you know, to be called out on, on those arguments they used. But I think we have to put it in context too. And this is a political, Negotiation. It was not a moral decision. It was a political one. So that's, uh, I don't know if that answers it, but um, and by the time, um, you know, the 1920s progress and, and uh, restrictions on, on black women become more solidified, the suffrage movement doesn't exist anymore. You know, they've dissipated. There's no such movement. So we can't expect them to have fought it uh, as it's being, uh, perpetrated on black women because they're not, you know, individually they can, but there's no movement to, to, to fight it. So that's, again, it's complicated. It's really, really complicated. Not to, I, I would never defend it, but I do want to explain it. 
Thank you so much. It's really wonderful that you're here and have shared your commentary. I'm thinking for our students, are there archives, collections, holdings that you have found to be especially useful that you would recommend that may be available online or in person? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's and so which many. ones would those be that you think are, are strong mm -hmm. in this area? There's so many, and there are more coming every day. In fact, the Library of Congress has now digitized the, the papers of the National Women's Party and uh, the National American Women, uh, Women's Suffrage Association, uh, the Blackwell Family Papers, which has Carrie Katz papers, all of these things that I had to um, not only go to, to the library to look at in manuscript form, but also use the microfilm, which anyone who knows using microfilm does weird things to your eyes after a while. And, um, but now they're digitized. You can just bring them up. So um, I would say the Library of Congress is a very great resource. Um, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, uh, the Radcliffe Institute, is dedicated to the history of uh, American women's uh, history. And I would recommend that as a great resource. And some of that is online. Um, uh, of course, for my story, the Tennessee Archives had uh, kept every little scrap of paper, every, every little note, uh, and that was a great, great resource for me. Uh, but then, you know, there, there were other specialized libraries that I, that I also used. But I would say for your students, Library of Congress, Schlesinger, and um, um, and even um, Al the um, Women's Party headquarters, Bill Mont Paul, has some things online that are useful. And more are coming every day because there's a, a big push to digitize this now. So there's lots of things out there. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I have done a fair amount of work on this subject myself, and I wasn't expecting to learn much here. But I really took away a big lesson, and I want to ask you about it. It, it came from the visuals mm -hmm. uh, that you used. It, it became very apparent to me that a lot of the opposition to the vote, a, as you also mentioned, uh, was a fear that giving women the vote would disrupt the division of labor within the family. Mm -hmm. Men would have to take care of the children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this was seen as horrible. Um, and it struck, me it struck me because the next women's movement that right. came along Same took, thing. actually fought for that, uh -huh. for opening up that division of labor. But um, I, I want to say that other coverage I'd read about the opposition emphasized uh, l uh, liquor companies mm -hmm. funding the anti-suffrage movement because they were worried that women support prohibition. This mm -hmm. is a big factor. And I didn't, see, I didn't see much mention of this fear of wrecking the family. Uh, so I wonder if when you were selecting the, uh, the different visuals, um, were you trying to find the ones that focused on this disruption of the family, or um, is it just much more prevalent than I realized? It's much more prevalent. Okay. It's very thank, prevalent. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and what's so interesting about it is, as you say, it seems very modern. I mean, when, when I was first encountering this, I remember thinking to myself, I remember that argument. You know, when women went to work, when working women went to, when mothers went to work. I mean, we all heard this. Um, it, it didn't go away, I guess is what I'm saying. So it seemed very modern, um, very uh, emotional, and uh, it was definitely used as a very strong argument, not only to convince men, but to convince other women to be uh, wary of this. This is going to disrupt your family life. I mean, the, the anti-suffragists say, look, divorce rates are going to rise because if women can vote, then husbands and wives are going to argue about the, the candidates. They may have been right about that. <laughs> um, but it's uh, very much uh, a sense of this isn't just some big political change. This is going to affect you at home. Your children are going to suffer. Your husbands are going to suffer. I have a question about the radical politics of the era. Mm -hmm. If I remember right, and probably I don't, 
the socialists were pretty influential in the 19 teens and 20s. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about what their position was on mm -hmm. whether they supported women's rights or not. That's a great question. And yes, the socialists, um, you know, the revolution in, in, um, in <clears throat> Russia had just happened. So there's both a lot of the socialists in America supported women's suffrage. And you see it in elections, in, in referenda uh, on the state level, like in New York, um, there's a big socialist vote. And they, they tend to support uh, women's right to vote. On the other hand, it's used by the anti-suffragists to say, aha, the socialists are um, supporting this. The whole thing's a communist front. Um, and, and they attack the suffrage leaders, including Carrie Cat, as being Bolsheviks. I mean, there's, there's, there are tomes, there, there are uh, brochures um, entitled let's say, The Secret of the Red Behind the Yellow. The yellow being the, the suffrage colors, the red behind the yellow. And there's a lot of literature saying that this is really creeping socialism. They want women to be equal. Soon they're going to want all people to be equal. And um, yeah, so the that's, that's, socialists are definitely in the suffrage camp. Uh, and, and it's a double-edged sword, because then it's used against the suffragists that they're getting support from the socialists. Eugene Debs is a big supporter. I read an article that, that many of the wealthy women were aunties because they had a lot of power mm -hmm. being wealthy women and they didn't want all women to have that. Can you comment on that? Yeah, it's, it's, that? it's true, with, with, with many, many exceptions. Uh, um, uh, Florence Hillis is uh, a very wealthy woman. And um, so for the most part, that's true. That um, one example that always brings gasps from my audience. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was not an anti-suffragist, but she never supported the movement. At this time, in 1920, she's in her mid-30s. She has five little kids. She was brought up in the milieu. Who needs the vote? Uncle Teddy's in the White House. Um, you know, these are women who not only had the social connections, but their male relatives were running the government. So they didn't feel they needed the vote when they could whisper in the ear of their uncles or fathers. Um, and also, they felt, you know, factory women were going to have the same vote as I do. There was definitely a class aspect to it. Uh, so yes, in, in most part, um, in many instances, the anti-suffrage movement is run by wealthy women. Uh, but then there are very wealthy women who also support suffrage. So it's, it's, it's not uniform, but yeah, you, you find a lot of conservative wealthy women are, are appalled. Appalled that women, first of all, are marching in the streets. I mean, how undecorous is that? So um, there's lots of reasons that they're very nervous about this. But you're right. Well, I think it's time to give our speaker today a huge round of okay, applause. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh,